We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Why should we care about anthropogeny? I have yet to meet someone who is not interested about their origins. And societies around the world have come up with a rich array of stories, origin stories, that try to explain where we come from as individuals, as societies. These stories range from omnipotent creators in the sky that created everything. They often involve features of, of the, the experienced landscape, including the sun and the moon, or features of the ecosystem, such as giant clams or important food items. And the collection of all these origin stories provides us with a rich heritage in really important stories, some of them extremely influential at a global scale. Since the advent of genomic technology and the possibility to compare DNA in all living things, we can actually use comparative studies of DNA to piece together the evolutionary tree of humans as mammals and primates. And this evidence shows us that we shared common ancestors with other primates several million years ago. For example, with chimpanzees and bonobos, their common ancestor had a common ancestor with us between six and eight million years ago. We also have hard evidence in the form of fossils, fossils of bipedal apes. Most of the old ones that are older than two million years are found exclusively in Africa and provide hard evidence for an African ancestry of our distant ancestors, eventually leading to larger bipedal apes with larger brains, smaller teeth, and eventually leading to our species with the modern human-like morphology of Homo sapiens. Just to remind you that the entire recorded history fits into this tiny sliver of time, the time between the invention of annotation and, and, and writing all the way up to Google is just 5,000 years deep and illustrates how deep into the past we need to look if we are to piece together the actual story of our origins. So humans have been around for about a third of a million years. For most of this time, there was no farming and no writing. Human societies consisted of, of small scale societies, much lower numbers of humans across the world, initially restricted to Africa until about 100,000 years ago. And the history of writing is at most 5,000 years old, which means there is no history. All of this is prehistory but played a really important role in shaping who we are today, because it's generations upon generations of people living in these small scale societies and surviving and producing the next generation, eventually leading to us. Now, interestingly, the last 12,000 years, which represents the, the last integration known as the Holocene, is when settlement first appeared and then farming. And the written record, again, is 5,000 years deep. It turns out that most of the information we have 
archaeological and written records is from this period. So whenever we talk about human origins, what I have observed is that we tend to revert back to where all the data are, all the information is located. Unfortunately, that is not the formative period of the species Homo sapiens, which is much deeper. It's the last 300,000 years, and we concentrate on much on the data from the last 10 to 5,000 years. Humans in modern times are jumping around places around the entire planet. This is due to technological advances, namely airplanes and jet engines. This is just one day's worth of global human behavior. It went down a little bit during the COVID pandemic and is now ramping, ramping back up again. But compare that to our closest living relatives, the great apes. Common chimpanzees here in, in East Africa, in Tanzania, and bonobos here in, in, the, in the Congo forests live on an area roughly the size of Pacific Beach and Mission Bay, 30 to 40 square kilometers, and patrol those very jealously in the case of common chimpanzees, even though bonobos can encounter a neighboring group, as you see in this picture, they usually reside on a relatively small territory, completely different from the pattern of global human behavior, facilitated by technological advances. But rather than just technology, humans have come up with a social cultural niche that consists of shared symbols, personal names, kinship terms that allow the formation of groups of groups or tribes, shared rituals, dance and music, sacred spaces, group identity and shared representations, and a much increased capacity to cooperate with and compete against other groups. Now, the goal of anthropogeny is to use a transdisciplinary approach to study the development and the interactions between humans and compare those to our closely related great ape species. We also rely importantly on archaeological data, ancient DNA data, and fossil data to interpret the phylogeny, the biological history of these species. We can compare these species to other species, including non-primates, importantly cetaceans, corvids, songbirds, and cooperative breeders. Very important data come from paleoclimate proxies such as drill cores, pollen, plant wax, soil carbonates, and stable isotopes. We also have the option to study developmental pathways using cells or organoids in vitro and translate the genetics, observe how the, the genotypes, the genetic information, translates into phenotypes. All this development happens, of course, importantly in an environment, and in the case of human, the cultural environment is paramount. This slide shows a short collection of biological features unique to humans that clearly are correlated with cultural behavior. I shall highlight two areas, the use of cooked food or cuisine and spoken language or language which can be signed or spoken and how these have affected human biology. Now, people studying humans often have important blind spot. Why? Because they are humans. Uh, this is one example. The, the giant of French anthropology, Claude Lévi-Strauss, wrote an entire book in 1964 called Le Cru et le Cuit, The Raw and the Cooked, in which he proposes that cooking is a purely cultural phenomenon and has no effects on biology. It's a very uh, hard viewpoint to defend these days that we know about the important differences in masticatory muscles and teeth and jaw and so forth. Similarly, biologists have commonly have important blind spots for cultural phenomena, such as language. One of the most famous evolutionary biologists, Bill Hamilton and E.O. Wilson, uh, try to explain human pro-social behavior simply by kin selection, the virtue that you can share more than average amounts of genes with other individuals, or reciprocal altruism. They didn't pay attention to the importance of reputation, third-party punishment, and so forth. Uh, in 2012, the late uh, E.O. Wilson actually published The Social Conquest of the Earth, in which he gave much more importance to social phenomena that seem to be unique to humans. It turns out that blind spots are shared with other primates. The Kiswahili proverb, Nyani haoni kundule, huliona la mwenziwe, means that the baboon does not see its behind, but regularly sees those of others. And this is a problem we suffer from in all human undertakings, but especially in anthropogeny. 
Now, both biology and culture are incredibly important for understanding our, our origins and our history. You all have come across the important quote uh, and famous quote that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution by Theodosius Dobzhansky. Another quote that is much less famous goes as follows. Human evolution cannot be understood as a purely biological process, nor can it be adequately described as a history of culture. It is the interaction of biology and culture. There exists a feedback between biological and cultural processes. Focusing on culture, it's become apparent that a person's beliefs and practices should be understood based on that person's own culture. We all struggle with this immensely as we are so used to our own norms and cultures and it's very hard for us to imagine how other cultures work. This cartoon is a good illustration of this. And what prevents us from understanding others often has to do with our narcissism and ethnocentrism. For example, we name the group of animals to which we belong primates from first. We name our species sapiens from knowing. We name stone tools invented in Africa after French towns like Acheulean or Le Valois. We name archaic hominids that lived across Eurasia after a German valley, Neanderthal. We name ancient humans from Africa arriving in Europe after French caves, Cro-Magnon. There is a long history of a European surprise at the mental capacity of fellow humans living as foragers because of a massive underestimation of the demands on cognition for these foraging traditional lifestyles. Similarly, in Africa, there's at least three different areas that are vying for primacy in where humans evolved, such as the cauldron of human evolution in the Afar Triangle in Ethiopia, the crucible of human evolution in Turkana, or the cradle of humankind in South Africa. Early ethnographers from Germany who had spent a quarter of a century in Southeast Asia came back to Germany with the conviction that there was such a thing as a psychic unity of humankind. Is it possible that we all share a basic biology and a mental framework? Is that that explains that my friend Umbugoshi, who is a Hadza forager and myself, can laugh at the same practical jokes, or that a key Swahili proverb about baboons works on an international audience? Or is the case that we cannot possibly understand others due to the differences in our lived experiences, for example, living in a mansion in La Jolla versus having to live as a homeless person in the same city? Let us hope that most of us become better at at least imagining the lives of others. We urgently need to do so in order to take better care of each other within and across societies. There's a lot of utilitarian arguments to be made for studying our human origins and engaging in anthropogeny. For medicine, human health and disease are profoundly shaped by evolutionary trade-offs, where things like survival and reproduction are actually causing completely different adaptations. Things like the hygiene hypothesis. No hygiene is bad for you, too much hygiene can be very bad for you as well. In terms of human reproduction, a lot of, of uh, industrialized societies have seen a massive delay in paternity, which can be biologically costly. Parents and mothers have stopped sleeping with their children or stopped bre breastfeeding altogether. All these things can come at a potential cost. In terms of nutrition, the, the more information on the importance of omnivory in our deep uh, ancestral past uh, will be part of how we will solve the feeding of soon to be 9 billion people on the planet. We're only beginning to appreciate the importance of what we eat on our microbiome and health. Educating and rearing children, uh, there is a lot of evidence for alloparenting, the role of, of adults other than the parents and grandparents who survive in humans as a very rare oddity in evolution. Similarly, the, the pro-social nature of human, the, 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 the documented inequity aversion that many humans have, and the concern for reputation could all be harnessed for increasing altruistic behavior. Violence in humans is, is, is profoundly male biased, both uh, within families, within groups, and between groups. There is potentially a role to play for, for much more female solidarity in controlling male violence. 
Technology is shaping the young minds and bodies. Cities are being planned uh, in, in an effort to mitigate some of the, uh, the effects of the Anthropocene and to improve social opportunities. Physical activity has huge impacts on minds and bodies and public health. And there is much information on traditional societies that have not settled and are still foraging and what their physical activity pattern look like. Finally, we, we are directly causing the sixth mass extinction on this planet and, and information on the importance of biodiversity at all levels, from large animals to plants to microbes, is extremely relevant to, to many of the current crises. We have become the planet-altering ape and are currently driving climate change. And so understanding how humans tick and how they got to this place of actually turning a very stable climatic period into a rapidly warming planet is really important. All these topics have been visited over the last 14 years with a lot of Carter Symposia, and we are hoping to, to have many future symposia to further discuss these important topics. Returning to the stories uh, and the curiosity of all humans about where they come from, it is embarrassing to admit that we still have no idea why we are bipedal, how old the use of fire is, why humans have a brain three times the size of their closest living relatives, how we humans became symbolic, how old language is, signed or spoken, or a combination thereof, and how it evolved, and most importantly, why it is only us that seem to be asking these questions. I'd like to end by congratulating our Carter member Svante Pabo on his Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And I would argue that this is, it hasn't been lost on, on the Nobel Committee that studying our deep history in the form of paleogenetics and essentially establishing a whole new research field and training many, many successful scientists who now have their own labs is, is worthwhile both to satisfy the profound curiosity that, that characterizes us humans and for its many applications uh, from medicine to many, many areas. So with that, I thank you very much.